Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Wadier. And I'm Tommy Welling, and you're listening to the Fasting for Life podcast. This podcast is about using fasting as a tool to regain your health, achieve ultimate wellness, and live the life you truly deserve. Each episode is a short conversation on a single topic with immediate actionable steps. We cover everything from fat loss and health and wellness to the science of lifestyle design. We started Fasting for Life because of how fasting has transformed our lives, and we hope to share the tools that we have learned along the way. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Fasting for Life podcast. My name is Dr. Scott Wadier, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Tommy Welling. Good afternoon to you, sir. Hey, Scott. How are you? Doing great, my friend. Looking forward to a good conversation today. Uh, We're going to frame this uh, episode with the end in mind. So we want to be talking about your results, whether you're new to fasting, you're an extended, uh, experienced faster, uh, or if you've dabbled here and there, maybe you've hit the the uh, the weight loss plateau and it's mm-hmm. starting to get a little stale or the fasting fatigue. Um, but one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about this is because we hear from a lot of people that track their blood sugar Um, and that they really can't seem to get consistent numbers. They'll see it go down while fasting, but then return or kind of ebb and flow. Yeah. Um, And maybe they haven't been tracking long enough or um, it's new or, you know, there's some, you know, diabetes in the mix or whatever. But a lot of people track for, you know, getting more information about how their body is responding, what their health is. They know the importance of why blood sugar matters because we can't test insulin at home, but it's directly related to, your insulin response, which is what we want. We want to be focusing on the underlying cause of weight loss resistance. Um, Mm. And so it's going to be interesting because we're going to hit on some probably over simple things that maybe people have forgotten about, or, you know, maybe um, if you, you've, you've, if you started and stopped, or if you're, if you're struggling to, to continue to see the results, or maybe you're at maintenance and how to maintain those results. These are the simple things that you can do to keep your blood sugar levels, um, and get your blood sugar levels to go down and then stay down long-term. Yeah. And some of these things, uh, you may not even realize that, that these are main contributing factors because, um, you know, like, like for me, I had my blinders on for years and years and years trying to figure out why I couldn't lose the weight, uh, why I couldn't keep it off. You know, I was working out like a madman cardio until I was, you know, blue in the face, um, tracking macros, tracking calories, um, just everything I could I could think of, but um, I was I was guilty of a lot of these things that we're going to talk about, um, and I had kind of pushed those off as like I'm outworking all of those little things, you know, like I'm I'm doing so much proactively that there's no way those things can be important, but the data says completely otherwise. These things are main contributing factors to our blood sugar levels because they have a, a significant effect. Um, on our insulin response and our insulin sensitivity. And, and that's what controls our, our weight and our weight gain and our overall health profile. Yeah. So, you know, what, why do most people come to fasting? Well, they come to fasting and you might've found our podcast because fasting generates weight loss, right? So that's the shiny object. And then once you, you know, mm-hmm. are pulled out of the matrix and you take the red pill and you join the fasting for life journey, or maybe you've come from other podcasts or, you know, other books or whatnot, and one of the things that I love about what we do is we kind of go all over the map, right? We look at studies, we look at the, you know, the, the challenges, we look at the, the feedback and what we hear from you guys, because we started this with the conversational nature in mind, because yeah. um, we're on the, we've been on this journey with you. Um, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, the, the, the consistencies in some of these things, right? So, right. And, and some of these might be ahas and some might just be like, oh yeah, duh, right? So um, the first one, and we'll just go through and talk through some of these is um, hydration. So lack of water intake can lead to increased concentration of pretty much everything um, in your body, right? So Mm -hmm. blood volume, um, you know, we want to be keeping the hydration levels high. And what they found in one of the studies looking at type 2 diabetics, which are, you know, people that have severe blood sugar levels that are elevated, um, the, the levels in the blood sugar raising in the bloodstream, um, were, were more severe when you were dehydrated. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like oil in your engine. Um, you're, you're going, if you, if you start to run low on oil, 
Um, everything is going to build up faster. The machine cannot work as efficiently as it should. Like if we, if we are low on water, if we're low on hydration, our, our machine machinery cannot work very well. And like you said, the concentration of everything in the blood goes up and you know, that's, that's, generally indicative, like most things in the blood, we don't want higher concentrations of the, the body's trying to control that, but it can only do it up to a certain extent. And we hear from a lot of folks that when we go through a challenge and we, you know, we, we're going to talk about hydration and that's, that's a real big struggle point for a lot of folks who are not used to just, you know, drinking water on a consistent basis. And it can be a big uh, contributing factor. And this goes kind of counterintuitive to what a lot of people think is, oh, I'm retaining water. That's why I'm not losing weight. Mm-hmm. I'm avoiding salt, right? I eat salt, I retain water. But when you're fasting, your body is going to go through a process of diuresis, which is going to get rid of the water because it's literally breaking down the glycogen and getting that stored energy supply, which is allowing your body to tap into fat burning mode, Mm -hmm. right? With insulin being the on and off switch, literally getting there, you're going to be losing the water. Your body is going to be excreting more. You need to intake the salt trick or the salt fix or optimizer and increase your water intake with the electrolytes or trace minerals. And it's going to help balance everything out and actually allow your blood sugar levels to stabilize. So if you want to start losing weight or you're at a plateau, look at your water, simply look at your water intake, maybe increase it by, let's say you're drinking 60 ounces. Let's increase it to 90 and do that for a couple of weeks and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good actionable advice there. Eating late at night, Tommy. So this is a big one for me when I had a uh, CGM or constant glucose monitor. Yeah. Put that baby on. I had it for a couple of weeks, did some, you know, lab rat guinea pig stuff and um, had some aha moments that came out of that. But we want to be, um, you know, and when we talk about the OMAD lifestyle, the one meal a day, OMAD means one meal a day. Intermittent fasting is typically a 16, eight window. When you get to the OMAD or the one meal a day, which can be a really great strategy for losing some weight, dropping insulin, you know, allowing hormones to balance out all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will pick dinner. Okay. So eating like dinner, it's with the family. It fits in their schedule. A lot of people like to skip breakfast if they've been in the fasting world already. Um, But what I found was, and what the the studies show too, is that eating a, a, a meal late at night is not the cause of the weight gain, but it can cause your body to have higher blood sugar levels throughout the night can just disturb sleep, which is another one we're going to talk about and, um, eating the meal. And I did this eating the same meal, you know, 12 to two in the afternoon versus six to seven at night was like, I can't remember the exact number, but it was like a 30 or 40 point difference in what my blood sugar did post that exact same meal. Yeah, as we get later on in the day, our body becomes a lot less um, adept at at actually pulling the blood sugar down and actually having a, a good insulin response like we want to see. So it gets a lot slower to actually do that. So and um, when we're when we're starting to come up, um, you know, getting closer and closer to our, our sleeping hours, it the, the the margin of error, like there, there's there's very little room for error. Um, we don't have much time to kind of make make that up uh, within the body. And when we, when we start to try to go into the sleep cycle, it can be completely uh, disturbed. And, you know, that's going to affect our, our deep sleep, our REM sleep, the quality of it, which we know that we've, we've covered in previous episodes, um, that when we wake up the next day, if our sleep was disturbed, um, we're going to have even higher uh, insulin resistance levels that following day as well. So that becomes a compounding problem. And, you know, we've, we've asked thousands, literally thousands of people, what, what is your favorite meal of the day? And more than 95% will say dinner. And so if it's, if it's one meal a day, most people, like you said, are going to choose dinner. So picking that time wisely and focusing on a little bit earlier dinner rather than a later one, it actually has a, a very significant effect on, on what the body does with it. Specifically the blood sugar levels too. So when you're looking at that, the combination of the sleep and eating later, moving that, moving that meal a little bit earlier in the day, changing our eating window, maybe doing some fast cycling and picking some different windows. Um, and we know that some of the studies show that the obstructive sleep apnea, you know, that even in healthy individuals, lack of sleep can cause higher blood sugar levels, Mm -hmm. which means your body has a surplus of energy, which means it's not going, which means insulin needs to be increased, which means you're not in fat burning mode, which means you're not in weight loss mode, which means 
you're not in the scale moving mode, which means mm -hmm. it's like that, that slippery slope. So that's why I really like that moving the meal a little bit earlier. Um, and then speaking of meals, mm -hmm. large meals, high in carbs and fat. So, um, combining those two, right. Can cause prolonged levels of increased blood sugar. So combining like, so for instance, if you ate a meal that was higher fat, lower carb, or let's say mostly protein and fat with a little bit of carb, um, your blood sugar will spike. And usually within, you know, two to three hours, you'll get back down to a normal level or maybe your normal level. If you have blood sugar related issues like diabetes or prediabetes or syndrome X or something like that. Right. But when you combine these both high in carbs and fat, then you're talking maybe five plus hours for those levels to come back down. Yeah. And the closer we get to bedtime, the worse that's going to be within the insulin response on the body. Keep seeing the scale tick up. And, and those two go together so much. I mean, they did for me. Um, I, I know they did for you for a long time too. If you think back to like, you know, being, being a kid and then, you know, high school and then college days. And then, and some of those habits that can live with us, like eating late at night and eating larger meals that are high in carbs and high in fat, like every fast food meal that I've ever had was high in carbs and fat, or like most restaurant meals too, are, are just, just like that. And they tend to be later on at night as well. And they're going to go right along with another one of the, the big offenders here for insulin resistance and for, for blood sugar not coming down, which is alcohol and how it's, it disturbs our sleep too. So we just put, you know, four of the, the biggest offenders tend to go one right after another, um, right. you know, in a, in a matter of, of lifestyle choices that they can't be undone by waking up the next morning early and going to the gym. It's not, it's not going to matter. It's not going to undo those things. Yeah. So insert fasting, right? Cause then you're going to be setting the stage in your favor, which is why right. it's fasting is so powerful, but you, you almost made me see the P word, right? The P word that ends in ZZA because that's another one, right? So yeah. I'm just going to give you a little hint here. If you have not had fat head dough, um, go make it, make the pizza at home rather than getting the pizza. Oh God, I said the word, the pizza hut. If you guys yeah. have been listening for a while, you know that this is my thing. If you're fasting, my apologies. If you're, you've gone out on a walk, <laughs> and you're trying to avoid the food that's being cooked in the house because you're on a new fasting schedule, my sincerest apologies to you. This is something I need to break the habit of, and it keeps coming up. That also shows my relationship with it over the years hasn't exactly been a great one. Right. It is something I put into my our family's plan now where um, we will make the fathead dough, and it has a much less insulin spike. But that combination, mm -hmm. that almost um, overlap effect, right, Tommy, that you just mentioned, the yeah. layeredness of all of those first few that we mentioned – the hydration, the sleep, the combination of the high fat, high carb, the eating later in the, in the day. Um, yeah, getting up and doing three, you know, 30 minutes of cardio is not going to undo that. So mm -hmm. it's definitely in, inserting the fasting lifestyle into it, um, is really going to help kind of balance the scales there. Another one is really just a lack of movement. So in today's world, we are more sedentary than ever, <laughs> right? right? Especially after 2020 and all of the things and all the lack of movement and travel and getting out that we didn't do. It was really cool to see at the beginning of that, that there were so many people walking around the neighborhood because they didn't know what to yeah. do with themselves. I thought there was like a neighborhood parade. This was about, you know, about a year ago. I'm like, what is going on? Right. Did I miss a memo from, from the, from the, from the, from the community? Like I saw people outside I have never seen before, you know, like, yeah, I'm it's, I walk around the neighborhood and I have the dog. Yeah. And I had seen people like, who, who are you? How long have you lived in this neighborhood? It was, it was people who had, I don't think had ever left their house before that. Yeah. And it's like, I didn't know you lived here. Right. I didn't yeah. know so many people were around. It's yeah. crazy. Um, it's interesting because that's not the case anymore. So I right. think we, um, that was a quick little burst. Uh -huh. uh, maybe we should have kept some of those good habits, but um, one of the things that we're doing is, you know, literally um, the more we sit, the less movement we have is an indicator that, you know, your, uh, you'll have higher blood sugar levels. Um, it is, you know, when you have, um, no movement, you're going to be decreasing your insulin effectiveness, your insulin sensitivity. It can lead to the insulin resistance category, which is we, what we don't want. And that's why, you know, we, we did that whole episode just on walking because it is so powerful and it is a great place to start. If you're at a plateau add in some walking, if you're mm -hmm. just starting fasting, add in some walking, you don't need to be doing, you know, high level, high intensity workouts, 
you know, uh, five to six days a week, it's actually almost going to make the beginning stages of fasting a little bit more difficult. So getting moving in whatever way you can is definitely going to have a positive effect on dropping those blood sugar numbers, which is going to allow your body to enter fat burning mode. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it, it's, it's incredible how powerful of, of a tool that one is. And we've gotten a lot of comments, um, and a lot of emails about that one as well, asking some specific questions, um, like when's the best time and how long do I need to do it for? How long do I, or how quickly do I need to be walking? It's, you know, just, just get up, like whatever you're comfortable with, um, as soon as you can, after, after having that, that meal, just get out, start moving and the, the process will start. It was, it was about getting those muscles, uh, working. They have to lower the, the blood sugar. They have to, um, kind of absorb some of that and, and it requires less insulin to, uh, to process that and, and, and bring it all down. And if we can do that while maximizing, um, you know, what we actually put on our, our plate, go back and check out the previous episodes. Um, we will, we'll talk about, uh, insulin friendly foods, um, at another point and, and just how to kind of optimize what's on the plate and then, you know, do that with as much time before bed and putting, um, you know, some, some time between those meals as well. Those are all going to be optimizers. Yep. 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 There's one more here that really kind of stood out to me and it's part of the problem within itself when it comes, when we talking about blood sugar related issues, insulin resistance, um, that slow kind of building of that disease process over time, which shows up early on as big high energy swings, post eating, um, you know, the, the post lunch naps, the fatigue, the brain fog, the weight loss resistance. You can't get past that number. You lose 20, gain 21, you lose 15, gain 18, that resistance, that weight loss resistance. Mm -hmm. That's where it shows up early on. But obesity itself and obesity, meaning, you know, 30 on the BMI uh, or, or, or greater in that category in itself is an independent, you know, risk factor for things like diabetes. Um, but it is a cause of both insulin resistance and high blood sugar, right? So the pancreas has to go into overdrive to take the blood sugar from the food or from when your body creates it on its own and shuttle it into the cells, right? It needs to put it somewhere. It needs to get it out, right? It needs to use it because our body doesn't like to have more than just a few grams of sugar floating around in our bloodstream. And what's hypothesized and what's been shown in some research is that the fat cells themselves release um, fatty acids into the bloodstream that slow down the uptake of that energy by your cells. Right. So obesity in itself is a problem of why you can't get your blood sugar down. So it's like, well, wait a minute. I thought that was the cause, right? Well, mm -hmm. no, it's kind of like, as it grows, it grows with the problem. Right. Yeah. So the other thing with that is, um, one of the potential reasons that's been looked at is that the overfilled fat cells kind of create this low level inflammation that's not severe enough to create like obvious standout symptoms, sure. but it can also affect then your body's ability to handle the blood sugar. So how do we, why is it that we want you to get the weight off? Well, because then you're undoing part of the problem within itself, which is the weight, right? So it's right. like this catch 22. Well, how do we do that? All the things we just talked about and using those fasting cyclings or those fasting windows um, to really, you know, get, get the best advantage possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, um, put, putting, putting these, these strategies into place are, are going to be the way to, you know, help while we, you know, whether you're, you're fasting or you're inside your actual eating window itself. So, you know, for an action step for today, take, take one or two of these things and, and actually start implementing it today. Like just, just one or two. Um, what you, what you think may be your, your biggest offenders here. Don't try to change everything all at once. Right. Because then we have like a new year's resolution kind of situation where we made so many changes and like none of them stick. Uh, Let me give you one example then Tommy, cause I really like that is just stop grazing. Okay. Like just stop snacking. Yeah. Like that's one simple thing you can start with. Here's my fasting window. Okay. Don't eat the breakfast sausage off your kid's plate. Don't right. finish your daughter's lunch. I've done it. Like the <laughs> peanut butter and jelly sandwich that I made that she didn't eat. I'm like, Ooh, that right. looks good. The almond right. butter, Ezekiel bread, <laughs> sprouted grain bread, like little toast on it. You know, got mm -hmm. the, the sugar, the, the homemade strawberry jam. I'm like, that's hard. So just one simple thing, like you said, don't try to change it all is just maybe stop the grazing. Yeah. 
And then, you know, even consider taking it a step further where you, you put a little bit more time in between those actual meals, like set a timer and actually wait for it to go off to actually intake your next meal and know that your insulin levels got really, really low um, during that time in between, because we didn't have those, those little grazing or, or, you know, the, the snacking or, you know, additional um, insulin spikes during that, that time. And if you're not sure what that looks like or, or how to do it, um, go to our website, thefastingforlife.com and download the fast start guide. It has six st- simple steps to implement uh, one meal a day or OMAD fasting into your day-to-day life. Yep, absolutely. And if you're looking for a group of like-minded individuals, you can also uh, head over to the Fasting for Life community on Facebook, where it is a rapidly growing group. Uh, The energy is incredible right now. There's just so many new people coming in uh, from brand new people to experienced fasters. Uh, So it's something that we created um, to be an area of judge-free zone, right? So however fasting is going to get you the results is how we want you to use it. We want it to be conversational. We want it to be encouraging and account have some accountability there. So like Tommy said, go to the website, down the fast, download the Fast Start Guide. You can head over to the uh, Fasting for Life community group. Join that group. It's a heck of a lot of fun. I'm always in there stalking and watching and commenting and just seeing the incredible wins taking place. So um, it's a really great group. So with that, cool. you guys got some work to do. Pick one thing. Maybe it's grazing. Maybe that was me speaking to myself. Not really <laughs> sure. But Tommy, as always, appreciate the conversation and we'll talk soon. Yeah, thank you. Bye. So you've heard today's episode and you may be wondering, where do I start? Head on over to thefastingforlife.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive fasting tips and strategies to maximize results and fit fasting into your day-to-day life. While you're there, download your free Fast Start Guide to get started today. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to leave us a five-star review, and we'll be back next week with another episode of Fasting for Life.